I have been um, talking to uh, quite a few people since the lockdown about conservation, about passion uh, for wildlife, about policy, about photography. Um, obviously, all this is largely because of uh, my love affair with nature. Uh, while I work in 23 states, um, and as the Wildlife Conservation Trust, uh, we work in about 160 to uh, 165 national parks and sanctuaries across these 23 states, uh, from Kashmir to Kerala, from uh, Gujarat to Nagaland and uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Um, we work a lot in tiger reserves because our main objective is to secure large landscapes um, using tiger as a flagship species or for that instance, large carnivores. So tigers, Asiatic lion, um, the leopard, and all those carnivores that need large landscapes. Um, because of these carnivores, we have also moved out of protected area network and we work in several corridors. We try to secure them by uh, helping the government mitigate uh, negative impacts on the linear infrastructure that's cutting these landscapes. And India is not about uh, tigers, only about tigers and these large carnivores. And it also has so many other species. It is one of the global hotspots in terms of biodiversity. As far as uh, uh, pure numbers go, India has more than 1,300 species uh, of birds. Um, we have about 1,500 species of butterflies, nearly 10,000 species of moths. Um, large number of snake species, hundreds of them. We also have uh, more than 400 species of mammals. So other than the 15 or 16 cats that we have, wild cats we have, uh, there is a whole gamut of other mammals that, we've, that we have, nine species of deer, uh, several species of antelopes, including the largest that we have is the blue bull. We also have the Chinkara, we have the smallest deer of India, the, the mouse deer. And uh, we cannot even start counting the number of plants that we have. There are nearly 25,000 species of flowering plants. And so when you talk of biodiversity and you talk about travel, uh, you don't necessarily have to go to the well-known parks only to see wildlife. They are, that's, wildlife is pretty much everywhere across the country. I belong um, to the western parts of Maharashtra. I live in Bombay and right in the heart of Bombay city, we have a national park called the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. Um, it has uh, the highest density of leopards that you have in India. Uh, it has nearly seven to 800 species of flowering plants, um, more than 50 species of reptiles and amphibians and nearly 40 species of mammals. So just right in the middle of one of the most densely populated uh, cities on earth, we have such prolific um, um, ecosystems. And so today, um, as the title indicates, I'm going to focus on those parks which are no, no less than the iconic ones like the Kaziranga or the Kanha or the Taroba or Nagarhole um, or for that matter, uh, some of the parks of, uh, the, in the Himalayas. Um, like the Great Himalayan National Park. A lot of people go to these parks, but India has uh, more than 600 protected areas. Uh, I mean, national parks and sanctuaries, over 800 protected areas. I think uh, as per the last count, we have about 870 um, national parks, sanctuaries, conservation and community reserves. And so there is so much that one can do um, if uh, you are passionate about wildlife. This photo that you see in front of you um, is from the Kaveri sanctuary in Karnataka. This is River Kaveri and uh, you can imagine how uh, every morning and evening can be on this uh, water course. It is one of the best places to see the grizzle giant squirrel which is um, highly habitat specific uh, and because of that it uh, is threatened. Um, 
and so you have such beautiful places pretty much 50 kilometers from wherever you are whoever is there um, on this talk wherever they live in india i'm sure within 50 kilometers from where they live they will be able to go to a place as beautiful as this uh, so to start with i'm going to um, take you to uh, one of my um, i have also not visited this place enough i would want to go and actually live there for a year if i have, if i can this is the meho wildlife sanctuary of arunachal pradesh um um for people who don't know where this place is uh, it is about it is the closest town is roing uh, and that is r o i n g uh, and that town is about 3 hours from dibrugarh in assam uh, the sanctuary is up in the mountains uh, as part of the eastern himalayas um the altitude is highly varying from uh, 400 meters to all the way 3500 meters so it is a steep uh, gradient and because of that it is highly biodiverse because species um that are found there are species that live in different kind of habitats uh, temperatures change moisture regimes change rainfall all those things and even the vegetation so it's a very very um, beautiful park this is at a lower reaches this is say around 1500 meters or so where this photo was taken where it is very lush but as you go up you will start getting uh, rhododendrons and you start seeing in fact you can even see snow leopards there it's a fascinating place um, um and i whenever i am in the forest and i am pretty much um enamored by vegetation and so i take a lot of pictures and photographers especially uh who who would who like to take pictures just on your mobile phone can also visit this place um there are so many different species of flowers uh, that you see this is in much higher altitude this is about uh, 2000 meters uh, this is a rhododendron again um, not very far far from uh, a mayodia pass um that's where there is a, a military substation and in fact not about 4 or 5 kilometers from there there is a a guest house um it's called the coffee house and i think uh, that is the best place to stay it is no by no it's not a lavish place but it has everything you need primarily uh, and the most importantly it has some fantastic uh, local cuisines the food is very good there and most of your walks will have to be along the road which is a tar road but you could always walk in a bit um on both sides and uh, the sanctuary is famous for a small life uh, a lovely um uh, i mean a huge diversity of birds reptiles amphibians um but obviously it also has uh, many many species of large mammals tigers are there leopards are there snow leopards clouded leopards um elephants sero even the mishmi takin uh, which very few people have seen is there in fact when i went there i was told that a pack of wild dogs had uh, cornered an adult takin on a rock face and there was a deadlock between them and uh, the entire pack of the dogs and the takin they both were seen in that location for more than one and a half days and um, and so it's a fascinating place not only for people who go for large mammals but people who love plants people who love uh, uh, birds um, so many species of birds this is a small niltawa in one trip that we made about 2 years ago um i must have photographed more than 55 species but i would have seen so many more um owls um many species of um, bulbuls this is a striated bulbul a uh, beautiful uh, sunbirds there are several species of sunbirds i'm not getting into the names specific of these because i don't want this talk to be about identification of species i'm just trying to uh, communicate that biodiversity is what you must go for uh, names are only important for communication uh, with other uh, interested folk but otherwise just to see what these animals do is fascinating this is near the mayodeya pass um, this uh, all this this trip that i made was in april um, so even in april uh, some of these mountains are covered in snow obviously we never reached there this is this i have taken from many kilometers away uh, i was at a much lower altitude than this but because i used a 750 mm lens 
uh, it looks like I am right there. Uh, this is where obviously the snow leopard and several other species like uh, uh, mountain ungulates are found. Uh, very interesting to see the yellow-throated martin. This is again early morning. It was very misty and uh, these three boisterous individuals uh, were searching for food. They are carnivorous. Uh, in fact, they can bring down prey much larger than them. People have seen them kill adult langurs. They have also seen them predate upon uh, a small size deer and so on and so forth. So they are quite a, quite a handful. Um, as I told you, I love um, reptiles and amphibians as well. This is a very rarely seen snake. It is a snail eater. Uh, and the, uh, it's quite fascinating that, uh, and Northeast especially is well known for a great diversity because it has both the Indian influence and the Malayan influence. Um, from there, let me take you to a very stark, um, as you can see here, not a blade of grass, zero vegetation. Um, this is the wildlife sanctuary in the little run of Kutch. This is in Gujarat. Uh, lately, people have started going here, especially birders who like birds of prey. But if you go and if you, if I had to show this picture to somebody, and mind you, uh, you can't see the end of this path. So if from here where I shot, till my camera could see there was not a single grass blade. In fact, if you look at the altitude, this is below sea level because some of this is like a bowl and this is a marshland, uh, uh, a desert of a different kind. So it's a um, salty marshland. So during monsoon, uh, the sea uh, moves in a bit. There is water all over. You can't drive there. It's very slushy. As, uh, and as the water starts drying is when you get this uh, flat bed. Um, it gets desiccated. Uh, it looks lifeless, but it is not. Um, this is a portrait of me uh, in my vehicle. And this is the typical substrate that you see for miles on end. And in fact, the little runoff catch is about 5,000 square kilometers. And nearly 98% of this land looks like this, uh, listless, uh, lifeless. However, if you go there in the right season, and if you, uh, it is full of life. And I was, when I went there for the first time, I just fell in love with it in the very first evening. And I drove all the way from Bombay. This place is very easily accessible from Ahmedabad. So if you, uh, if you fly to Ahmedabad airport, it will take you not more than two and a half hours. Uh, there's a good place to stay. It's called the Run Riders, R A N N R A R I D E R S. Uh, uh, it is in a village called Dasada. So if you go to Google and ask for Dasada, you will see Run Riders. It is a fantastic property, very rustic. Food is extremely good. Um, and I am mentioning food because in India, you know, it's very important uh, for people. Um, and a lot of tourists will go to beautiful places, but crib if uh, they've not got good things to eat. Um, uh, so this place, Run Rider, is about 30 minutes bike drive to the desert. So the desert is all around it, but you have to go through uh, a, a quite a bit of a distance. So if you have to get into the desert before sunrise, you have to be ready uh, more than 30 minutes before that. And in winter, winter, which is the peak season, and the best time to go there is between November and March. Um, that's where you see lot of birds migrating into India through the runoff catch and then obviously dispersing uh, inland. Uh, and again, towards Feb and March, the same birds are then going back uh, to their breeding areas. So these are the winter migrants. This is a Merlin. In front of me, it hunted a lark and I, and I was actually lying on the ground and that's why I could separate this bird from the substrate. It, you can make some most beautiful pictures of uh, birds there. This is a, it's a very large, in fact, one of the largest vultures in the subcontinent. It is called the Cinereus vulture. Uh, the Andean condor is larger than this in South America, but otherwise this is a monster in terms of size. Again, if you can see the horizon, it's all flat. Um, and you see these vultures coming in from the north uh, into India during winter. Um, and around this uh, desert, there are some fantastic wetlands. And Gujarat is dotted with a lot of these beautiful uh, water bodies. 
um, this is me in one of these water bodies. So you don't have to go to the desert every day. So if you go and spend two, three days, uh, a day or two, you should spend in uh, wetlands, which are at the periphery of the desert. And uh, you know, there is, these are oases and these are loaded with birds, thousands of species of birds, as you can see in the background, this is a turn which is which was diving into the water, uh, um, not for catching fish. I realized it was actually wanting to bathe. And you can see in the background, a lot of grass and some birds which are out of focus. Um, it's also a very good place for seeing the short-eared owl. And this owl, um, it's surprising for most people that it actually migrates from uh, far off distances. And uh, they come and they spend a lot of time on the ground. Very difficult to see them, but they are very common in the desert. And they, they in the day, and they are uh, uh, relatively more diurnal than many other large-sized owls. And they are there, therefore, you know that there is enough food. They feed on rodents, they feed on uh, locusts, they feed on grasshoppers. Uh, there is enough and more for them to eat. There is even the habara bustard that comes during winter. Uh, but uh, I love the time that I spend with uh, the desert fox. And this is probably the best place to see the desert fox. Um, in fact, as I talk to you, they are already denning. Their pups will be out in no time. And uh, so Feb and March is the best time to see pups this size. After March, pups have grown in size and then it's almost impossible to see them. They are very skittish. But during the this denning season is when you see them. Some amazing natural history observations I have made. I have spent hours on end observing uh, the desert fox. Um, with a big lens, so at safe distance, it's very easy in deserts to get very close to animals. So one has to keep in mind, but uh, your guides will tell you to keep safe distance and you must obey that. That's very, very important for tourists. Wherever they go, uh, they must follow the law of the land um, and also the law of the species because several species, uh, if you go to a tiger reserve and you see tiger walking close to your vehicle and you feel all animals are like that. But remember that in the breeding season, uh, fox, outside of the breeding season are almost impossible to see, which means they don't like disturbance. But because they are denning and they will be close to the den. Uh, and at that point, because the maternal instinct of the fox takes over, she allows people, but it's, it's uh, very clear that she is not comfortable. So you must maintain that distance. So long lenses are important. Um, no selfies of wildlife because for selfies, you have to go very close to them. Um, uh, this is a older sized pup. Uh, uh, no, actually, it's almost a sub adult. Um, it was photographed very late in the evening and I was again lying on the ground and it was the mother brought a lizard for, for, uh, for him and uh, he ate a bit and then started playing with it like most pups do. Uh, they're very cheerful, playful, uh, even kittens, young cats and dogs, basically canids and felids are very cheerful and playful. And if you are, if you happen to synchronize your visit during this time, you will see some fascinating thing. It's called the wireless sanctuary um, for obvious reasons. You have, um, and I find the wildlife very, very majestic. They're quite a character. Uh, and they are not found deep inside the flatlands. They are found along the periphery because there is some grass and vegetation uh, along the periphery, but they are confined to the wildlife sanctuary, which occupies about 500 square kilometers. The little runoff catch is uh, 5,000 square kilometers. Um, sunsets are, you know, so good that, uh, I mean, every evening and uh, in fact, when I was in, um, whenever I'm in um, little runoff catch, I don't miss Africa because Africa, especially in the flatlands, you have some fascinating uh, sunsets. Um, and the little run of catch allows you this kind of thing where animals can actually be uh, silhouetted in front of a setting sun. Flamingos by the thousands. Uh, you see them during this season. Um, in some interior parts, they breed, but uh, tourists, uh, it's very difficult to go to those areas. But these are uh, water bodies closer to the periphery of the, of the desert. And that's where you will see. In fact, I have not included many photos, but I have photos in which there are more than 10,000 flamingos in one frame. Um, and these are the vehicles, open vehicles that uh, take you around. A fascinating place, definitely worth many, many visits. 
then from so we are now going into from uh, himalayas northeast we've gone to the west of india which is um, really the desert in gujarat and then we are straight to neyar wildlife sanctuary which is in one of my favorite states kerala anybody who loves wildlife uh, will love kerala because of the it, and in fact the term jungle um, has come from places like these in the western ghats kerala is part of the western ghats uh, lush green and india you know the term jungle is our own word actually um, um so it's a very very different habitat evergreen forest lot of water very very beautiful uh, landscapes and every in in uh, and i remember my one of my trips to neyar and neyar uh, is not very far from trivandrum airport tiruvananthapuram at as it is called um, now only about 30 to 35 kilometers from there and there are some places to stay most of it is government uh, owned so there is an in inspection bungalow which is i think just two bedded bungalow then you have a guest house with about 10 beds and there is there is a dormitory also and there are uh, you know some other there is a youth hostel there um, so and what is good about uh, trips to kerala especially to the forest is that there the forest department conducts the one day or two day treks so you go to periyar you go to um, any sanctuary including uh, silent valley uh, or arlam there are so many uh, lesser known unknown sanctuaries um, and good forests in um, kerala most people know of uh, periyar they know of iravikulam which is uh, near munnar but very few people outside of kerala know about these places so neyar is worth a visit again um, it has large mammals tigers leopards elephants gaur um, nilgiri thar nilgiri langur but it is also very good for trekking and uh, it is safe because you will be accompanied by uh, the guards um obviously you have to follow certain rules the two day trek you walk you take a boat for almost i think a 9 km that boat ride is this is a photo from that boat ride and in the morning as the sun um, breaks out the first 30 40 minutes or maybe an hour every 5 minutes the landscape looks different because the color of the light changes the way the light falls on mountains changes it's just mind boggling and and some of these photos i have made on a walk um uh, through this park and you can imagine how light is mingling with the forest um there a lot of rivers and streams inside mostly um completely covered with uh, trees in fact there was no light in here so i had to actually increase the exposure to be able to capture this and just to sit at the uh, at the edge of such a stream and keep listening to bird calls and gurgling sound of the water is fascinating um again uh, this is uh, my guide and the forest guard who was with me uh, as he walked and i photographed this where i wanted to show that the roots of trees are actually the dams Uh, that nature has built and that slows the flow and therefore the water seeps into the soil uh, all you need is small dams like this but human beings build large dams and submerge so many thousand square kilometers of forest um again when you walk you see different kind of wild wildlife when you go in a vehicle in tiger reserves you focus on large mammals but when you start walking Uh, can people switch off their mics, please? I'm getting some disturbance uh, from your. Thank you. Um, so, uh, when you walk, walking is the best way to feel the forest. It's like driving is the best place to understand India. So, when you go on a road trip, you understand the culture, you understand the people. That's the way to feel the country. Similarly, when you walk through the forest, is when you start seeing small things which uh, most of us overlook when we are on a typical game drive through a tiger reserve so this is a wine snake was crossing the road uh, saw me and immediately raised up it's a semi venomous snake um, no death has been reported but uh, you can get nausea and vomiting if it bites you uh, it is a rare fang snake so you don't have fangs in the front it's behind here it's quite potent for the food of this snake which means lizards it feeds on other snakes also it's quite a beautiful species um, also the uh, the calitis uh, 
this is the green calatus that you see very very beautiful again because it's a evergreen forest lot of arboreal species species found on trees and tree species which are green in color so that they can camouflage with the forest um giant squirrel jumping around uh, i was on one of those rivers and uh, i saw this giant squirrel and i just took my camera and looked up and i i i, I knew that the branch had ended there and that it will jump and it was uh, so it was an opportunistic photo but i i like it very much you know it it communicates freedom um smaller life lighter, lesser tids uh, skinks beautiful again you can see the color change from the head bronze all the way to um orange and buff beautiful again when you walk you see indirect evidence so this is something uh, uh that um, one needs to do this is basically poop of a civet uh i don't know which civet it would be because obviously this was dropped in the night uh, so it could be either the small indian civet or the common palm civet because both those species are found there uh, as you can see it is fed on laburnum uh, cassia fistula you can look at some of the seeds there uh, and so this dropping is basically um, nature's way of planting trees so uh, i don't believe in man made plantations i don't encourage people to plant trees near the jungle i i say protect the jungle let the species that are found there plant those trees because this is planted along with the manure and so the seeds obviously have gone through the gut and the gut acid breaks the outer hard uh, skin of the seed and only then some of these seeds will sprout so if they fall just from the tree straight on the ground they will never sprout it has to pass through the bird or a or an animal or a mammal gut so interesting stuff again flowers um and i i actually you know people associate with me with large carnivores but i am completely in love with uh, plants uh, flowers and lot of thing and vegetation all these leaves the leaf litter in the western ghats the nutrient is all stored in the first 2 feet of foliage and some soil on the ground it is not highly the soil is depleted in nutrients uh, by looking at those trees you will think wow uh, the soil will be highly nutritious but actually not true the black cotton soil and the uh, the alluvial soil up along the rivers are the soils that have lot more nutrient because they uh, get enriched by the rivers whereas in the western ghats contrary to popular belief um the soil is not very rich so most of the nutrients is in the leaf litter and therefore forest fires are extremely bad for forest most people even in the city in our buildings we collect leaf litter and burn it we should never do that because this is where the most uh, amount of nutrients are and uh, and so such photo you know with monochrome more more or less brown with a flower that has fallen from the tree um uh, again such boats are there you could go for a short boat ride like this but there are motor boats that take you when you are on a trek they will want to cover that distance rapidly and and during that period there are motor boats but they can slow down if you want to uh from there i move to uh another place which is uh, extremely dear to me uh again in the western ghats but slightly north of kerala this is in goa goa is uh, normally associated with uh beaches and the sea but i live in bombay i i pretty much in my during my childhood would spend uh, mornings every mo every week in the beach so i never go to goa to to enjoy the sea i go up in the mountains this is a place uh, in at the tri junction of maharashtra goa and uh, karnataka so there are sanctuaries on all sides on maharashtra side you have what is called tilari now then you have mahadev so this where i'm seeing from the room that i was staying in is uh, mahadev's wildlife sanctuary goa and you have bingar in karnataka so it's a amazing place uh, and this property is beautiful um, many people uh, know about this but most people try and spend time along the sea i think this is called wilderness uh, this there are there are two properties one is wilderness Uh, which is an older property but the new one also is very good this one is swapnaganda which is almost about half a kilometer from wilderness and it is owned by the same 
uh, people. Uh, extremely beautiful. Food is fantastic. Um, sights. This is from the kitchen. This is where you will spend your evenings eating. And you can see the water body at the bottom. The cloud is below you. Again, this is uh, up in the mountains, made more than uh, about uh, nearly 1,000 meters from the sea. Uh, extremely beautiful sunsets. Uh, this is the Madhi Sanctuary. And so much you can see just from these properties, either Wilderness or Swapnayanda. Um, um, and then you can go on walks. There are walks in the morning that take you to a water body. Again, the best time to go there, although you can go all throughout the year, but if you are interested in uh, snakes, frogs, insects, um, and the lush green forest, then uh, September, October, November, December is the best time. In fact, it also has an infinity pool in both these properties. And there is every millimeter of this place is photographable. This is a fresh sprouting leaf from a shrub. Um, beautiful, I love this photo. This is a cricket, but this was a cricket just after it molted. And so the wings are still developing. It looks like a doll. And I spent three hours um, observing this animal uh, emerge from its older exoskeleton. So it was molting. And I have a series of photos, but I have only shown you this one. But it's, it was fascinating. Um, this is me photographing a snake. You see here, there is a, a flying snake. Uh, this is again on the property. And as I so the next one is the photo that I took. Uh, when I was, so this is the photo I made. Um, somebody photographed me photographing this snake. Beautiful again, found on trees. This one actually was not very far from the kitchen. Um, and uh, even in snake photography, I like to, um, you know, leave the animal where it is and try to photograph. It's not easy to photograph snakes, but when you get photos like this, uh, it's worth its weight in gold. Um, Amazing if you go there in September, October, you will, that entire property is reverberating with the calls of um, the Malabar uh, uh, gliding frogs. Um, it's a great place for the Malabar pit viper as well. Another perspective of the uh, flying snake. You can see the droplets, it was raining. Um, some amazing times I've had. Look at the frog every evening. So your activity, there, you can go for treks to a waterfall, which is about two hours. Then you have an evening trek. Uh, but if you are interested in reptiles and uh, amphibians, then the best time for you is after sundown, which means at seven o'clock till I normally, when I go there, I don't do much. I just keep looking at the mountains in the day. And my activity period starts at 6.30 and it goes on. I come back for dinner and then again, keep walking. Uh, I spend nearly uh, seven or eight hours and sometimes sleep at four o'clock in the morning. And this is what you see from where, from your uh, um, guest house, so wherever you're staying from your room, you will have a view like this. Um, you can go to what is called in Karnataka. So this is just one kilometer from there and you enter Karnataka. This is Chorla Ghat. Uh, and this Chorla Ghat, uh, again, that walk on the laterite plateau is extremely rewarding, very pretty. This again was in October. But this will, the water will obviously dry out by December, Jan. So um, again, nocturnal life. Uh, this is an owlet, owl moth uh, feeding on kadam flower in the night. So uh, at least 500 moths were there in a small patch of, uh, I would say 10 feet by 10 feet, uh, sitting on every single flower. You can't see the other moths behind this, but there were at least another 15 moths, smaller ones, feeding on the same bloom. Uh, from there, this is the last, uh, uh, you know, park that I'm going to talk about. I can go on and on and talk about uh, 200 parks that uh, each one of you should go and visit. Uh, and this is uh, one of my favorites in Kashmir. It is called the Dachigam. Uh, it is called Dachigam and it is right close to, I mean, it's like Sanjay Gandhi National Park in Srinagar. And so you have to fly to Srinagar and then... Uh, Pretty much there are a million of, uh, you know, options for you to stay. You don't really have to stay in Dachigam. You can stay in Srinagar and every morning go and spend time in this beautiful place. Um, it's just mind-bogglingly beautiful. This again, uh, the best time would be March, April, May, June, July. Uh, the drier seasons are better, but people who love snow, right now if you go there, it is covered in snow. So 
December, Jan, Feb, it will co completely be cl closed in, uh, in snow and therefore you see hangul's, which is the, the most famous uh, deer, which is found there, some watchtowers that the forest department has created, very tastefully done. Um, and it is one of the best places to see the Himalayan uh, black bear. These, this photo was made on foot and this was done uh, in a season when winter was approaching. So the bears were just busy having uh, seeds uh, which are loaded with oil, oak seeds uh, um, and a lot of other uh, seeds that fall off. They were just gorging on them so they didn't bother about you. So bears behave differently in different seasons. During this phase, uh, they are the safest to observe on foot. Otherwise, they have to keep safe distance because uh, they can become unpredictable, but largely because of humans, not because of them. Um, Himalayan langur, that is the common langur, but the Himalayan uh, species has a lot more hair for obvious reasons uh, because the temperatures go down. Um, this is me photographing the river. Uh, this is what came out uh, during that phase that I spent that day. Very, very pretty. So many different brooks and streams all over. Lush green vegetation. Uh, it's just mind-bogglingly beautiful. For people who are interested in plants, uh, India is an amazing place, you know. And without the plants, you won't have such biodiversity. So plants have a very, very big role to play when it comes to the ecosystems that we are in. This was a chance encounter of a female scorpion. On top of it, there are babies. So the female actually is carrying a, you know, I would say a truckload of babies on her back. Um, so they have hatched. I mean, so they, once they are born, uh, they climb up on the mother and they stay there till they molt for the first time. And that could be, that sometimes could take about uh, a week or more. And the female pretty much cannot use her sting because this mass will fall off. So she is very vulnerable and she doesn't eat during this time. So this is, a, this is how, you know, we normally say mammals, um, there is a lot of maternal care and all that. But uh, in animals that we call brainless, um, they have such instincts where mothers can actually starve to make sure that the babies survive. And the babies, after they molt, they, decept, uh, they start moving in because scorpions otherwise are cannibalistic, which means uh, one scorpion can eat another one. And so, but the mother, uh, for this period, uh, despite feeling hungry and having so much of food on her back, will not eat them. But the moment they start walking down, um, they know that they can't spend so much time on her because her instincts may change with time. Butterflies everywhere, I'm not focused on them, but they are again something that will keep uh, you occupied if you're interested in them. Uh, again, dandelion, this is a, uh, you know, the seed. It's beautiful to see dispersal. Uh, when the breeze blows, uh, the dandelion seeds will just go like, and you can see the, um, the seeds will fly because they are, you know, so buoyant in the air. And they can cover uh, many kilometers like this from one mountain to the other. And macro photography, this was actually taken with a phone, uh, my phone. So if you have a phone with you, you can do many things. Uh, so, so I started with uh, Kaveri and this is uh, Kaveri again. Um, Kaveri River, dry, looks lifeless, but loaded with wildlife again. Uh, this is a photo that I took with a tripod. So it's a port, uh, it's a selfie of a different kind. Um, so that's that. Um, you should, you know, I would encourage that you explore newer places, India. And if, if you do, if you go travel to five new places every year, you will still need, um, you know, four lifetimes to cover the national parks and sanctuaries that India has. And I am not focused on places which are outside, but there are so many beautiful uh, biodiversity hotspots even outside the national parks and sanctuaries of India. Um, so you could stay in touch with me. These are my contact details and also on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so that's it.